Uh, this presentation is called Staying with Son Rethel on the Embryosis of Capital. So as I said, uh, what I will be trying to do in this presentation is to uh, provide just an overview of um, Son Rethel's work. Um, and uh, Jayla also has a very, very strong knowledge of Son Rethel, so you get some more of that in the next session, um, as well as uh, respond to uh, what I think has been uh, the most ubiquitous uh, critique of Son Rethel, according to which he conflates in certain respects uh, the, the circulation of commodities with the production of commodities. So we'll, we'll get started. Um, what I have here are just a few, for those who don't know who Alfred Sonrethel is, Alfred Sonrethel, of course, uh, created the idea of real abstraction, um, and I have created, uh, taken some brief sort of biographical notes here of him. Um, he was born to a German bourgeois family in 1899 in Nuit Chaussin, uh, near Paris, uh, and, and his family was a very uh, wealthy industrial family. I think they had connections to the Oppenheims. Uh, and he was raised by his uncle, a steel industrialist. Uh, actually, his parents were painters. Uh, I've heard that they they gave him to his uncle, who was a steel industrialist, uh, because they didn't want him to become a painter. Uh, so, you know, maybe understandable. Um, in 1917, um, uh, Son Rethel enrolled at Heidelberg University. Uh, and from 1924 to 27, he spent time in the Amalfi Coast. Um, in this period, he met uh, Benjamin, Bloch, Krakauer, uh, and Adorno. And actually, in this period, um, obviously, uh, uh, there are dramatic events in this time. You think of the Spartacus uprising, uh, you know, the failure of the Bolshevik revolution to sort of transmit itself uh, to Europe and most importantly uh, to Germany. Um, but uh, it's interesting, he has a piece um, he wrote in this time called um, Naples, a philosophy of the broken. Um, and in that piece, uh, what he sort of uses this, this kind of Marxo Heideggerian analysis. Uh, but what he talks about is the way that in Naples, and keep in mind, this is Naples in the 20s. So in many respects, um, it still sort of resembled like the 17th century, right? This was a very uh, underdeveloped part of Italy. And uh, what he talks about uh, is the way that in Naples, people have a little bit of an adversarial relationship to technology. Um, you know, in a way, things always break down. In a way, they don't necessarily try to fix them or they're sort of relieved uh, when they break down, you know, because it pre prevents, it, you know, it... it, it they know in, in a sense, right, even subconsciously that it sort of uh, mitigates against the usurpation of their society by capitalist modernity. So it, it's an interesting piece. And I think, um, you know, does already in, in sort of a subtle way uh, show how attentive, and I'm gonna get to this shortly, but show how attentive, uh, even when he was younger, uh, you know, uh, San Rethel was to the demarcation between, you know, capitalist and pre-capitalist societies. Uh, he finished his thesis, which was a critique of marginal utility econ uh, economics in 1928. Uh, and he also devised in the 20s his signature idea that there exists a homology between the transcendental subject and the commodity form, which we'll get to more of shortly. Um, in the 1930s, he became a researcher uh, for the MWT and engaged in um, uh, illegal anti-Nazi activities. So the MWT, if I understand, was a um, a uh, basically like industrial newspaper uh, that was uh, published and distributed um, uh, amongst, uh, I think, certain industrialists who were conducted, uh, connected with the Nazi regime and so forth. And so in this time, um, San Rethel was able to actually um, uh, harvest uh, information that he was transmitting to uh, anti-Nazi sort of forces. Um, however, uh, as the 1930s went on, um, you know, his associations, um, his associations and activities were uh, becoming more visible to the Nazi regime. So he realized, look, I, I got to get out of Germany, right? Um, so uh, in 1936, he actually met Adorno uh, in Paris uh, and he gave him a 130 page manuscript called the, the Social Theory of Knowledge. Um, and Adorno was, was originally, uh, initially really taken aback by this. Adorno was like, you know, this is the most amazing thing I've experienced since I first read uh, Benjamin. Um, but uh, on the other hand, Max Horkheimer was not so enthusiastic uh, about Son Rethel's work. And Horkheimer's basic objection to it was he felt that the scope of it was so, the purview of it was so wide that in a way, uh, Horkheimer said, look, it throws us back, you know, into these sort of classical philosophical problematics, you know, like the mind-body problem, where does thought come from, and so on. Which is a bit ironic because I actually think in many ways that would be like the strength of Son Rethel's work was the way that it, it, it connects, you know, Marxism with these very, very philosophical uh, issues, right? Um, but in any case, not, not to the taste of Horkheimer. Um, so because of that, uh, you know, 
uh, Sonnenrattel was sort of excluded from the, the inner circle of the Frankfurt School. Um, but uh, uh, Adorno did help him procure aid to leave Germany. And so in 1937, he went to England. Uh, and there he met the uh, Marxist classicist, uh, George Thompson, who I'm sure uh, Richard Seifert, for example, has, has written about, and he might say something about Thompson. Um, but Thompson is very, very significant uh, for his attempts to uh, sort of apply a kind of Marxist analysis to ancient history. And that ultimately becomes a very, very important part uh, of uh, intellectual and manual labor. Hmm. From 1938 to 1941, uh, Son Rethel wrote several essays on the economic conditions that led to fascism. Um, these were distributed to members of Churchill's circle and later formed the bulk of the text Economy and Class Structure of German Fascism, which was published in 1973, in English in 1978. I do recommend, if you haven't read Economy and Class Structure uh, of, Fasc of German Fascism, I really recommend you check it out. Um, obviously, Son Rethel is best known for intellectual and manual labor. But there's a really, really wonderful analysis um, in economy and class structure of German fascism of how the Nazis, um, you know, sort of um, appealed to uh, German manufacturers, basically, who were suffering, uh, you know, in this time of economic duress, um, you know, in order to bolster uh, their political support. Um, and, and how in doing so, they also alienated uh, a considerable faction of uh, sort of the international bourgeoisie or the finance bourgeoisie. So uh, Son Rethel talks about how Siemens, for example, were livid, you know, really upset about the Nazis because the way they were behaving was basically causing them to lose all these opportunities for bidding contracts uh, in international consortiums, right? So it's a very good and very interesting uh, analysis of, of the economics of Germany uh, in the 30s. Um, after uh, an aborted uh, attempt to prepare a manuscript in 1951, uh, Son Rethel finally publishes Intellectual Manual Labor with Lawrence and Wishart uh, in 1970, his life's work, right? Uh, this is the project you've been driving at for a long time. Um, in 1978, uh, Intellectual Manual Labor was published in English. And that same year, uh, Son Rethel was appointed a professor at the University of Bremen, uh, where he died 12 years later in 1990. Uh, so that hopefully gives you a, a quite a quite a dramatic life. Uh, that hopefully gives you a, a sort of overview. So the thesis of intellectual and manual labor by Son Rethel is, of course, that there exists a kind of structural symmetry between the Kantian transcendent, transcendental and commodity exchange. For Son Rethel, commodity exchange is a real abstraction, real insofar as it involves physical exchange, abstract insofar as it necessitates a system of quantification generative of what he calls non-empirical abstraction, right? So this is kind of what makes, and actually now we've gotten very loose about how we use the term real abstraction. Um, you know, we get like Alberto, like, you know, religions and real abstraction, you know, this kind of thing. But if you look at uh, Son Rettel's original sort of text, um, real abstraction, and I think actually in a way, the proliferation of the term is useful. But if you look at the original, original text, real abstraction is commodity exchange. Right, because commodity exchange has a, uh, there's something specific about commodity exchange for Son Rethel, which is that yes, commodity exchange occurs in, in you know, a spatio-temporal domain, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it, is, it is generative of abstraction, right? You know, and, and, and this is where, you know, of course he, he talks about how mathematics and geometry are related to this, but we'll get to that. To exchange two things required, it requires that they be related to a notion of value. It is this relationality which permits us to form a category of substance that is permanent in time. And pay close attention, and this is Kant's language, to permanent in time. Likewise, whereas Kant treats Euclidean geometry as part of our a priori intuition of space, geometry, in fact, has a social origin, which coincides with the development of commodity exchange. I'll talk about that later. The same can be said of the principle of inertia. Due to the fact Newton's theory lacks for an empirical referent, Kant was driven to model the concepts of science, not on nature, but on the pure concepts of our understanding. So yeah, if you look at like the idea of inertia and like Quirie and others point this out, right? It's like, you know, like an object that, you know, moves, you know, in, in this direction until it stops. I mean, there, there actually isn't examples of this in nature, right? So in a way, um, you know, Son Rethel treats this uh, as really important to Kant's uh, intellectual development because when Kant surveys the scientific achievements of modernity, what he's struck by is the fact that, you know, it's very, very hard to explain how these things are produced um, just looking at sort of brute material material reality, right? We have, you know, we have to, you know, where do, where, where is this capacity developed, right? 
In the metaphysical foundations, Kant declares, by the way, I interspersed this with a bit of my own research. In the metaphysical foundations, Kant declares that the law of inertia is an a priori law due to, should we extrapolate a bit, the way that the mediation of spatial intuition causes us to select a class of privileged inertial trajectories, then to define the notion of temporal equality on the basis of these trajectories. On the contrary, for Son Rethel, the thinking of inertia is connected with commodity exchange. Uh, what appears as static inertia in the age of pure commercial and slaveholding capital in antiquity, uh, and then later appears as dynamic inertia once capital accumulation is organized into a self-compelling system. So the idea is that for Son Rethel is that in any in any social context in which um, you know commodities are moved around, you know the the the, the formal question of movement arises, right? Um, but if you look at you know um, modes of production which are which have commerce, right, where people exchange commodities, but that aren't like capitalism in the sense that commodities are produced to be exchanged, and the whole society is organized around that process of production. What makes it different is that the object kind of stays in a state of stasis, right, until it's moved by the commercial process, right. Um, but this is different, right, in the capitalist context because the object is created to be moved, right. It's created to enter into uh, the capitalist cycle. Right? So there's a sort of you know, automatic motion, right? Marx actually says you know, capital is the automatic subject, right? which occurs in that context. Okay. As these passages suggest, for Son Rethel, Kant's quote, theory of cognition is correct to the extent that it identifies the formal properties of our thought. Um, and actually this is, I've heard Son Rethel criticized. I think it's, it's interesting because he, um, you know, he's not, um, it's not like he's he's simply putting these things forth and saying you know these are just these are just kind of this is just garbage this is just ideology you know it's quite a bit more complicated i think the complexity of of um you know son rethel's relationship to kant can really be captured um you know in the phrase necessary false consciousness which he uses to describe it like yes on one hand you know um there's a there's a, a falsifying aspect to the formal uh properties of commodity exchange which are transmitted uh to our thought um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, these have been and continue to be, in a sense, necessary, right? Um, so, you know, Kant does identify the formal properties of our thought, but, but, but these properties don't come from the mind. That's not where they originally come from, right? What they come from is, is the commodity structure, right? Um, of course, as Son Rethel knows, uh, commodity exchange is way older than the capitalist era Kant lived in, right? Um, and what this means is that if he's going to uh, make this claim, uh, you know, that Kantian epistemology is structurally homologous with the commodity form, um, he has to explain uh, the way that its constituent elements, right, we talked about Euclidean geometry, of course, there are many, uh, the way that its constituent elements are created uh, within a pre-capitalist context, right? So Son Rethel periodizes history into two, um, two syntheses, one centered on production, or labor and another on private appropriation. Um, though in a way, the productive element is latent in all societies insofar as production exists. The first, the sort of synthesis of uh, labor or production uh, is characteristic of foraging societies um, in which surplus labor was not exploited uh, and will be uh, characteristic of the communism of the future, we imagine. Uh, and the second, uh, societies of private appropriation um, correspond uh, to societies uh, in which surplus labor is appropriated, appropriated and exchanged from ancient Greek, Greece to the present. Of course, the degree of that and the, the way that functions will vary greatly. Uh, you know, so it's not, it's not a cut and dry sort of thing. Um, between these, there exists a kind of intermediary stage, uh, and it's not clear whether actually he, it's a bit ambiguous in the text. It's not clear if he really thinks it's a separate uh, uh, synthesis, but there's a sort of intermediary stage in which surplus product is appropriated, but not extensively exchanged. Son Rethel cites ancient Egypt as an example. So here's a quote from that. Once the produce was collected, neither the peasant producers nor the collectors had access to these goods for their own use, for the power and authority, uh, uh, the power and authority for the collection emanated from the Pharaoh. Uh, there was a transference of property, but a public, not a private one. Um, so I think, um, you know, what, what, Son Rethel is really talking about here, though he uses ancient Egypt as an example, is sort of tributary modes of production in which commerce has not become uh, widely diffused, right? Um, so sort of intermediary there. Okay. Oops, okay. Um, 
one second. Ah, sorry. Uh, okay, there we go. So here we have a here we have a, a graph I made, uh, and I tried to sort of graph out um, since I, I I can't you know sort of exhaust on Ruthel's historical analysis right here. Uh, I sort of tried to graph out uh, how he maps history, right? Um, so we have you know these different kinds of societies. I use some of his language, you know, primitive tribal, direct lordship and bondage, Greco-Roman, Middle Ages Europe, uh, and so on. And here we see the the kind of synthesis. All right. And you see that difference there too between uh, unilateral appropriation, which is sort of, you know, like in the context of ancient Egypt, like kind of governmental or pharaonic appropriation, right? Uh, and, you know, the development of processes of private appropriation. Um, we also see that this is not a straight line, right? This development, um, you know, uh, Sonrethel, you know, he doesn't portray just a continuous, um, you know, kind of historical elevation of the importance of commodity exchange. Uh, for Sonrethel, um, for example, uh, you know, he sees uh, the Middle Ages in certain respects uh, as uh, regressing from the, the sort of heights of, uh, you know, Roman commerce uh, prior to its latter period, right? Um, so, you know, it's a complicated sort of thing. And we also see, uh, we see the sort of different, different kinds of, uh, you know, modes of surplus appropriation, right? Um, you know, tributary ex extraction, agricultural freeholders, slaveholding commerce, you can see these. Uh, and of course, the exploitation of commodified labor power being a feature of capitalism, that's the very important and something Son Rethel recognizes as well. Um, and um, yeah, and you also see the kind of abstractions, right, in the way that these engender, right? Um, you know, in Egypt, we have kind of pre-scientific activities, like not geometry, but rope measuring, right, related to tribute extraction, Right in the Greco-Roman context, we get sort of ideal abstractions, the positing of science is autonomous, um, ideal abstractions mystified by religion in the Middle Ages. But what what, what kind of makes capitalism unique is that is that these things are posited as epistemology, and we'll explain that more uh, as we go on. For Son Rethel, the difference between ancient Egypt uh, and ancient Greece is illustrated by the way geometry developed within them. Whereas in ancient Egypt, the technique of rope stretching was used to parcel out soil afresh after the flooding of the Nile and ultimately to assess tributary payment, the relatively low stage of the development of commodity exchange meant the science did not become abstract. By contrast, the main centers of ancient Greece, and you know, we should always talk about Miletus, right, before we talk about Athens, right, which I, th I think we don't pay enough attention to, um, but were comparatively steeped in commercial exchange. Um, so Anrethel notes that the issuance of a uniform currency uh, in ancient Greece uh, occurred in the seventh century BC. And this is rather suggestively, I think, uh, the same time that the first philosophers, to use George Thompson's parlance, uh, developed a sort of conception of, of the substance or arca, right? So if you think of Thales' claim that all is water, right? The idea here is that um, the ability of Thales to think all of reality, right? As being composed, right? Out of a kind of constituent element Right, which presages you know, later developments in kind of Greek science, uh, that, that the thinking of an arca in that way is in a sense rendered possible right, uh, by commodity exchange having reached the level uh, where money, you know, uniform currency is being diffused. Right? Um, but of course, uh, the, the Moesian philosophers like Thales, uh, you know, all is water, all is fire, you know, you know all these things, um, uh, they still relied in a way on a notion of materiality. Right, um, you know, Thales is from from um, you know Miletus, which is of course near present day Izmir in Turkey. I'm sure if anyone of you have been there, uh, you would realize how natural it is if you're in that environment to imagine that maybe everything does come from water, right? Um, but um, uh, in Parmenides, we have uh, you know the substance sort of becoming the idea of the one, which is a more abstract notion that Son Rethel notes better uh, conforms to the character of value. Um, the development, you know, of course, subsequently we have the development of geometry and uh, mathematics in ancient Athens. Uh, and this is, of course, a crucial stimulus for Plato, whose theory of forms in many respects uh, responds to the achievements of, of mathematics and geometry. And, you know, this sort of classic thing, like you can't draw a perfect circle, right? It's like, you know, how is it that these, um, you know, how is it that these uh, sort of forms, right, which are mathematical and geometrical, um, you know, can yield results without necessarily having a tidy empirical reference, right? Which is something that, you know, he's trying to negotiate. Um, for Plato, you know, in San Rethel's account, it's possible to conceive of reality as governed by abstract forms because the abstraction of value had already come to play an important role in synthesizing its social process, right? Uh, 
Um, the development of abstraction is, con and I should add here, the development of, of abstraction is connected with the appropriation of surplus labor and by extension coincides with the opening up of a chasm between manual and intellectual labor. So if you think of any, if you think of any society, right, that, um, you know, we can discuss commerce, we can also discuss um, tributary extraction, right? If you think of, uh, you know, if you want to appropriate tribute from people, right, um, you know, this requires, uh, you know, an extensive apparatus, it requires some notion of like labor quantities accounting, right? Um, you know, uh, we were already talking about rope stretching geometry, right, in ancient Egypt. And then, you know, if you take a place like Athens, where so much of, you know, um, there's a huge amount for the time, uh, of importation and exportation, you know, maritime commerce happening in Athens, uh, that only uh, uh, lubricates further those sort of mechanisms, right? So, oh, and then this quote, which everybody loves, but uh, everyone loves this quote about uh, Plato, that which is which is quite sort of performative uh, that Son Rethel had. So I thought I had to put the quote, Plato quote in. Um, but are then the coins in the pocket of our money owner mere ideas? At this frightening thought, Plato grabs all the coins he can find in his pocket and ponders. These are things, he utters, and they are things not only for me, but for anyone to whom I offer them in payment for the commodities he has to sell. My coins are as real as my body, and as the meat they buy for me to feed on, as real, therefore, as the body of everyone else. And Sonrethel responds here in his own tone, immaterial money, ideal money, thought coins, what absurdity. No coin could be money without being materially real, right? Um, so he's developing here a sort of parallelism, parallelism between the platonic forms, um, you know, and the diffusion of money. And by the way, this here is a, um, a, a coin from 2013 uh, that was uh, minted in Greece uh, that sort of lauds the establishment of Plato's Academy uh, in Athens. So there's some, some kind of meta dimension there for sure. Um, I think in a way, uh, it's astounding. I've, I always find it, it's astounding, like how controversial Son Rethel's work is. I mean, I get that he makes some big claims, but I, I find it interesting that, um, you know, it's not so disputed by, by historians and ancient scholars that uh, there's a strong connection between, you know, mathematics and geometry uh, and the development of circuits of commodity exchange. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it, it's, it's fascinating that it, that it uh, is still so sort of contested as a thesis by philosophers. Uh, and I think maybe attests to um, you know, the bourgeois status of, of philosophy, to say. Um, but um, uh, one common criticism of Son Rethel's work, and you can see it's very expensive, uh, is that it's too va vague to attribute non-empirical abstraction, what he calls non-empirical abstraction, to commodity exchange. Isn't language, after all, non-empirical? Um, but this actually ignores the nuances of Son Rethel's commentary, uh, particularly that it's mathematics, what he calls, quoting Marx from section one of Capital, the commodity language, uh, that emerges within commodity exchange, not language itself. Um, language entails abstraction, but this abstraction does not presuppose quantitative commensurability, nor a uniform notion of substance, right? So language can be sort of provisionally applied to different categories, um, but it's not, it's not quantitatively comparable that way, and nor does it have this crucial feature, as with the notion of the Arca or the Hypokimenon, um, of being uh, permanent in time, right? Um, this is helpful also because I think it, it allows us to understand um, some of the differences between uh, animism, which sort of posits deities, which are neither unitary nor necessarily extra physical, uh, and later religious forms, whereas the latter required commodity exchange for their foundation. And actually, uh, if anyone here has read Alberto Toscano's on fanaticism, he has some wonderful uh, uh, writings on that, on uh, the relationship between commodity exchange and uh, Christianity, uh, which I don't know if he'd fully endorse today, uh, but um, check it out anyway. Um, so again, I think we really have to uh, understand, you know, again, I, I think that, you know, it's a little bit confusing because Son Rethel says these things like abstraction, but we really have to ask ourselves what kind of abstraction he's talking about. And if we fail to do that, we're really not going to understand, um, you know, the, the historical specificity of what he's trying to get at, right? Um, another common criticism of uh, Son Rethel is that he treats pre-capitalist societies as conditioned by Kantian epistemology. Uh, thereby alighting the way that these concepts only become generalized alongside commodity production, right? So how can you say that, you know, the Kantian transcendental was just kind of always there, right? How can you do that? But I think this also uh, misses Son Rethel's point that even if much of the Kantian apparatus originated with commodity exchange, uh, those concepts were not developed into instruments capable of dramatically aiding production, nor posited as express expressly epistemological prior to capitalism. Right? And we know epistemology is like 
what is it the 17th 16th century right it's, it's not very old right you know and certainly it's it's hegemony it's very new um so this is why uh this is why he stresses so much the achievements of what he calls galilean terrestrial mechanics and newtonian celestial mechanics because the their application of inertial motion amounts to euclidean geometry quote made real in the words of Coiry. so again we really have to differentiate um, you know, uh, uh, the character of the science of pre-capitalist science, right? And the character of capitalist science, um, you know, in, insofar as the latter, right, actually intervenes into the process of production in a far more uh, drastic way uh, than anything that preceded it. It's also why he stresses the historically specific character of epistemology. Um, Capitalism may not represent the genesis of these rudimentary concepts, but it does demarcate the, demarcate the point at which, the, at which they become indifferentiable from cognition itself, amounting to what Nick Land calls inhibited synthesis. He has this one, Nick Land has this wonderful, you know, early Nick Land, not this racist idiot, uh, has this wonderful uh, essay called Kant, Capital and the Prohibition of Incest in Thang Numina, which I think you can be read quite profitably uh, alongside San Rethel. Um, but the point here is that, um, well, as I say, San Rethel was, was well aware that in ancient Greece, surplus product came from a blend of commerce, slaveholding, and tributary extraction. Um, and it's for this reason that in this context, they're treated as metaphysical forms of knowledge only ex accessible to those who are capable of receiving them. So basically, uh, you know, these kinds of um, ideas, right, these sort of concepts that, that were uh, uh, transmitted through commodity exchange, uh, they existed before, but they existed as, as metaphysical notions. Right, uh, so they weren't conflated with the actual process of cognition itself. Well, how do those things become conflated with cognition itself? And the answer is that, uh, you know, and I know everybody likes to say, you know, Son Rethel doesn't understand the, the process of the commodification of labor power, but uh, how do they become transmitted? They become transmitted through production, right? Um, you know, because when you have, uh, you know, wage labor being generalized as a category, when you have production actually incorporating these categories, right, then it, these become things that have to be uh, 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 instilled in the public, right? You know, or a large swathe of the public, uh, in any case, for them to, uh, you know, sort of adequately participate uh, in that labor force, right? The most famous critique of uh, this sort uh, is the critique of uh, Moishe Postone, Moishe Postone, who argues that Son Rethel evaluates, quote, positively, uh, the mode of social synthesis purportedly affected by labor in industrial production as non-capitalist and oppose it to the mode of societalization affected by exchange, which he assesses negatively. So here you can already see something about Pistone's critique of San Rethel, um, which is that, um, you know, Pistone takes it for granted that whenever San Rethel talks about labor, that he's necessarily talking about capitalist labor, right? Um, you know, at the root of Pistone's critique is the idea that labor as a social category, social category, is specific to capitalist modernity, the era in which the law of value came to hold broadly and labor power was pervasively commodified. And so San Rethel reifies this category by portraying it as one that communism must actuate uh, as a form of social synthesis. Um, so, you know, again, the idea is that if you look at, at, at capitalism, um, you know, the way that you have, uh, you know, markets which flourish, uh, production being revolutionized, um, you know, um, uh, you know, the value of labor being brought uh, into correspondence with the value of labor in other markets and so forth. Uh, what this does is it, it effectively uh, causes uh, the forging of the proletariat, as we know it, right? Um, so, you know, when Postone sees this, I, this, this notion of labor, right, and I already said that for San Rethel, right, we have a uh, uh, a social synthesis, which is in a sense transhistorical, uh, but especially manifest within uh, foraging societies and, and the communism of the future, based on labor. When Pistone sees this this category of labor, um, you know his immediate reflex is to say, you know, well that is that's a, that's a reification, right, of something, you know, the, the development of a proletarian uh, proletariat, which is specific to capitalism. Right? It's true uh, in a way that. San Rethel does not, in intellectual and manual labor, adequately link up his conception of abstraction with the development of uh, systems of labor quantities accounting. Um, so that this is to say that, you know, um, San Rethel talks a great deal about value, the abstraction of value, um, but what he doesn't give us, unfortunately, um, you know, is a more uh, tangible uh, uh, or specific historical account uh, of, or detailed historical account, uh, of the um, 
of the relationship that the structure of value comes to have upon different societies in terms of the organization of labor and production, right? Um, and but but you know I would add he like Sonrathel doesn't do this for a reason, right? And the reason he doesn't do this uh, is because Marx himself doesn't stake out an unambiguous position on the historic relationship between labor and value, right? So Sonrathel actually quotes from Marx. The labor time socially necessary to produce commodities asserts itself as a regulative law of nature. In the same way, the law of gravity asserts itself when a person's house collapses on top of them. The determination of the magnitude of value by labor time is therefore a secret hidden under the apparent movements in the relative values of commodities. Well, you know, and of course the obvious difficulty with comparing, um, you know, the sort of uh, law of value or, or late relationship of labor and value uh, to the law of gravity is that one is a consequence of social systems, right? Whereas the other is uh, a part of natural science. Um, but but I don't, you know, I, I want to do justice to, to the way Marx deals with this. Um, because what Marx, I think if, you, if you're trying to discern some kind of consistency in the way he addresses this topic, uh, I think the consistent element um, is that Marx acknowledges that, that there was, all, there was he, you know, in a way, uh, there was always a relationship between labor and value, that's clear. Uh, but that that uh, relationship didn't become manifest for it to be consciously discernible until the age of capitalism, right? Um, and I think a lot of commentators have lost sight of this and said, well, you know, the law of value only occurs in capitalism, right? And they, they've ignored a huge amount of Marx's actual statements. Um, so, uh, you know, Marx, for example, uh, when he talks about Aristotle, right, he says that um, uh, Aristotle is able to identify the concept of value, but not, but not its basis, Right, because slavery prevented the commodification and equalization of the value of labor power. Right, so it wasn't it wasn't a, a sufficiently purified sort of capitalist market. Right, Aristotle could say, well, you know, um, things are exchanged with other things, therefore there has to be a common substance that unites these things. Right, what he wasn't able to look at was the basis of that common substance. Well, why wasn't he able to look at the basis of that common substance? Because there was not, again, a sufficiently developed uh, capitalist market. But nevertheless, even the fact, you gotta remember this, even the fact that Aristotle was able uh, to designate the concept, right, uh, shows that you know, the commodity form was already uh, imminent to his environment, right? Um, so Postoni is by his own admission influenced uh, by post-structuralism. And I think this comes across rather strongly uh, in his reading of, of Son Rethel, uh, as well as Marx for that matter. He criticizes Marx's account of abstract labor in capital, for instance, for containing a biological residue, because Marx says, you know, we have to remember this on one hand, insofar as all labor involves a sort of, um, you know, physically, physical aspect, uh, you know, which is quantitatively comparable, we could say that abstract labor is a physiolog physiological feature, right? Um, but I think this ignores, uh, you know, one thing Pistone never really discusses is Marx's uh, actual comments uh, on labor in the Grinrisse, uh, introduction to the Grinrisse, as it's called. Uh, labor seems a quite simple category. The conception of labor in this general form, as labor as such, is also immeasurably old. When it is economically conceived in this simplicity, labor is as modern a category as are the relations which create uh, the simple abstraction. Um, so again, he's trying, Marx here is trying to separate out, you know, the historic reality of labor, um, you know, whatever its importance, right, uh, you know, and the category of labor as it, we, as it would be deployed by someone like Adam Smith, uh, and as that relates specifically to a sort of modern capitalist formation. Um, on one hand, of course, this means that, you know, Son Rethel's notion of a social synthesis based on labor or production couldn't be thought without capitalism, that's very clear. Um, but on the other hand, this doesn't mean that uh, the historical or biological reality of labor can be ignored. As Marx states, human anatomy contains a key to the anatomy of the ape. It's only the capitalist mode of production that makes possible the identification of the significance of labor to history, even if labor as such must be differentiated from, quote, the modern category of labor. So what I want to insist upon here is that, you know, it's very possible to talk about labor in history and even to see labor in history is very, very significant to the organization of different societies. I mean, you know, uh, Marx even says, right, in the Grinris, that the transition to capital prior to industry is a merely formal change, right? Because, you know, we can talk about corvée, surplus labor, all these kind of things. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very possible to talk about that uh, without being somehow automatically ahistorical, right? An issue here, I think, is really the difference between a dialectical and a post-structuralist method. Um, I think very often, um, 
and uh, sorry, I made a I made a mistake here. But within a post structuralist method, um, I think uh, very often historical or biological structures are simply treated as derivative of social categories, right? As sort of discursive uh, constructions. Um, by contrast, within uh, sort of dialectical analysis, uh, it's quite possible to conceive of what Marx. Um, and this is what he calls uh, labor and money in pre-capitalist context, he calls them less developed concretes, right? Uh, as Marx notes, the less developed concrete may have already realized itself before having posited the more many-sided connection or relation expressed in the more concrete category, right? So Marx acknowledges that not only uh, is the less developed concrete there, right? It's also capable of structural development, right? Before it comes to articulate itself throughout the entirety of society, right? And I think this comes very, very close to what, um, you know, uh, Son Rethel is trying to say about money, for example. Um, as regards abstract labor, um, you know, because for Postone, it's, it's sort of, you know, capitalism, abstract labor, before capitalism, no abstract labor. I think, you know, this reading is very, very obviously in many respects uh, asymmetrical with Marx's actual reading. Um, but I think what's very interesting is that uh, Jacques Bidet, uh, in uh, actually a fairly uh, recent essay, um, the Lost Roads and Steep Paths of Real Abstraction, which was published in the, uh, the book, The Philosophy of Real Abstraction by Palgrave Macmillan last year, some co-organized with some Argentinians as well. Um, but Jacques Bidet has attempted to uh, address this sort of confusion and actually try to periodize uh, the development of abstract labor, um, which obviously has a relationship to abstraction. Um, so I think it's very interesting because Bidet has tried to uh, separate out what he calls labor one, labor two, and labor three. Right. So labor one is labor in general, which he describes as just doing something, um, you know, sort of in the fastest possible time you can and in a general context. Labor two is labor on the market and labor three is uh, labor uh, within, uh, you know, capitalist context. Um, so I don't really have time to elaborate uh, uh, Bidet's periodization too much, um, but I do think this is kind of, you know, this is the sort of research we should be doing rather than just um, taking this view of, you know, uh, not capitalism, capitalism. Right, you know, I don't think that's consistent with with the way Marx sees history, or Son Rathel, for that matter. Um, in general, uh, Pistone's analysis uh, tends to treat capitalism uh, as a kind of simple rupture and to se separate absolutely the pre-capitalist quote, capitalist quote circulation of commodities uh, from their capitalist quote production. Um, and this has some strange uh, sort of effects on his analysis. By the way, Paul, can you just give me the time? Yeah, you're about 52 minutes in. 52? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this has some strange effects on Postone's analysis. He claims, for instance, that Descartes' description of primary and secondary quali qualities is analogous to the relationship uh, between use value and exchange value, um, right? You know, in the sense that one is sort of the, the real, uh, uh, you know, real character of the object, right? And the, the other relates to its perception. But he also ignores the antecedents for this binary. Uh, and we can see, you know, Protagoras' idea that things are F, e.g. colored, if and, if, if and only they appear so to someone in Plato's Theotitis. So it seems a little bit strange to me to just start drawing parallels between capitalism, um, you know, and modern philosophy without doing any work whatsoever to interrogate, um, you know, the, the origins and influences of modern philosophy, right, and to relate that through these sort of economic categories. This also affects his entire conception of concrete and abstract time. For Pistone, in pre-capitalist context, time is only measured in relation to concrete functions, such as, quote, the time required to cook rice, whereas under capitalism, uh, time is defined by the usage of abstract units of calculation. We have the classic example here, right? Like in French, if you say like uh, the time, um, it's like uh, le temps, which is also le météo, right? It's like the weather as well, right? So because people got the time off the weather, right? There's the near classic. Um, so for this reason, uh, Postone, uh, this is actually really funny. <laughs> this is really funny in Time, Labor, and Social Domination. He gives this really elaborate description of why the Chinese system of double hours, you call the Xi or the Ki, ke, uh, does not meet the criteria of abstract time. He claims because its units bear names and they're not numbered serially. But what he totally ignores in this commentary is that like isolated elements of manufacturing capital that begun to appear in China as early as the Song Dynasty. Right, uh, you know when the hour in China was first divided. So you know, like it's like he's so dogmatically fixated in this idea that there's this separation that he can't even see these very, very I think clear uh, historical parallels that are right in front of him. Right. Ultimately, I think it's extremely dubious to suppose that the circulation of commodities can be so tidily extricated from production. 
or that real abstraction can be restricted to a capitalist context. The organization of any kind of extensive tributary structure will require one, one some capacity to quantify labor, and two, investments in production. And we can even go back to ancient Egypt, which did have, by the way, a labor market, you know, a uh, uh, wealthy class and all this. Um, but, you know, we look at uh, very important investments in, in infrastructure in terms of aqueducts or granaries, not comparable to capitalism, obviously, but uh, it does attest to the fact that production is not simply uh, a capitalist category. Of course, uh, if exchange becomes more normalized than this, as in ancient Egypt, um, which we see in Greece because of maritime commerce, uh, this further advances the structures. So I'm going to kind of bring it toward my, my conclusion on this. Uh, Sonrethel understands the way that, as Ernest Mendel puts it, embryonic forms of the law of value can be discovered in pre-capitalist simple commodity producing societies. Just as the elementary cell of capital, the commodity, contains in an embryonic way all the inner qualities and contradictions of that social category. Because of this, he's able to grasp how, as Heidegger points out, the concept of the subject can be traced back to the Greek, Greek hypocaminon, which quote, has first of all, no special relationship to man and none at all to the eye. So in, in other words, this is to say that, um, you know, what Heidegger observes is that if we're to trace back, you know, when you have these different subjects, subject them, you can go through history and Balabar has written <clears throat> very profitably on this. But if you, if you were to trace back the idea of subject, which we apply to people, you'll find that, um, you know, in it, it, its antecedent would be, you know, what we're discussing here, hypocaminon, archa, substance in ancient Greece. And this is not, it doesn't refer to a person, right? So how is it the case that, you know, this idea eventually becomes, um, you know, becomes uh, uh, subject, right? Substance becomes subject to use a sort of Hegelian lexicon. Um, and the answer is that the substance of value becomes subject in the sense uh, that labor power becomes commodified, right? Workers themselves becomes, becomes, become assimilated, right? To what were previously right? These sort of metaphysical designations, and that's what gives them their subjective character, right? Um, now, Postone, by, contra by contrast, has no conception of the subject, no conception of history in that way, pre-capitalist history. It's just the time of concrete, quote, things, which are variable in nature. Um, and because of this, he can't understand the way that the rudiments of our epistemology are assembled within simple commodity producing societies uh, long before they become imputed to man, right? And, but this imputation of man is itself a process, right? Uh, as Etienne Balabar has pointed out, um, the Cartesian subject is not the same as the Kantian one, right? We always think of the ego chikajito, okay, it's the individual subject, but you know that subject is not a fully autonomous subject. It's still dependent on the, the subject sovereign of God, who's a sort of real subject, right? Um, and it's actually Kant who sort of misreads uh, Descartes' ego chikajito and makes the ego cogito into a kind of living subject, right? So there's a, there's a gradual autonomy which is acquired uh, by the living subject vis-a-vis -vis the sort of uh, uh, overarching, uh, uh, you know, inhumanity of substance in this metaphysical uh, constellation. Um, and here you can see a little bit of a, a little bit of just I made a little graph uh, on the. Obviously, this is very very schematic. I love these I love these graphs. Like it's like stuff Althusser used to make. Like that's that's history. There you go. That's all it. Um, but yeah, so you see in ancient Greece, you have hypocaminon with the introduction of money, right, which is sort of the idea of category of substance. Um, in ancient Rome, we have, uh, you know, the, the, the triune god, uh, the development of the category of person. And I don't know if you know this, but, but the category of person actually comes from um, personae. Uh, it, it was the mass actors wore, and it was later used um, in ancient Rome because they needed a word that, re that, re that referred to God, the Father, and the Holy Son. Uh, so they created the word person for that reason. It was actually something to refer to all three elements of the Trinity. Um, I would relate, uh, you know, the, the development of the category of person uh, of, of person in ancient Rome uh, to uh, actually a little bit counterintuitively, maybe uh, the development of latifundia slavery, uh, which actually became a part of you know, was related to the expansion of money capital, um, because I think what happened in this context uh, was that um, slave markets became liquid enough. Uh, that uh, slavery actually began to function as a form of commodified labor power. And it's very interesting if you look at, if you look at someone like St. Augustine, right? Because what St. Augustine will say is like, um, yeah, okay, you know, um, you've had these political conflicts, uh, you know, in which some people have enslaved others, you know, God respects the integrity of these arrangements, but let's be clear, you know, uh, in a purely theological sense, you know, everyone's, you know, a person, 
in that way, right? So, so when I talk about this quasi commodification of labor power, it's very interesting because you see this in, in, in Christian Rome, you see this division between uh, sort of the theological uh, or the religious designation of the person and the actual uh, uh, you know, social or political designation of the person, right? Um, then in the late, you know, uh, in the Middle Ages, we have, of course, the idea of man higher in the chain of being, ultimately sort of emanating from the, uh, the substance of God, um, this being related to economic parasitization by the church, as well as the use of religion to justify serfdom. Um, and then I think we have a distinction here between the first stage of capitalism and the second stage of capitalism. Uh, in the first stage, uh, we see that the ego cogito is posited as with Descartes, but still reliant on the subject sovereign of God. And this is uh, characteristic of, of the stage of capitalism in which, um, you know, uh, the shift has begun to focus toward the exploitation of wage labor, but extensive automation uh, has not been accomplished. Uh, and then you have a sort of second stage of capitalism where the ego cogito uh, becomes a sort of living subject, as in the work of Kant. Uh, and I think uh, this has to do with the extensive implementation of machines, which accelerate the shift to wage labor. Wage labor is, you know, very, very convenient in that respect because it's very flexible. Right. You know, and, and Marx points out when he talks about the division between, um, you know, absolute surplus value and relative surplus value that, you know, in a certain way, uh, relative surplus value uh, de-emphasizes uh, the infinite extension of the working day. And so I think if you if you it's, it's interesting, right, like even if you look at something like slavery, I think if you look at a, a place like the southern United States in which there were changes uh, which occurred as a result of capitalism, but at a slower pace than in urban centers, you can see why the category of slavery persisted and metamorphosed within a capitalist context, whereas in industrial centers, that was not needed, right? So I think you, you know, you can, it, what, what, what Son Rethel really gives us is uh, a, a science of epistemology, a science of the subject, you know, the, the first time I think we've ever been able to do this uh, in a truly scientific manner. Um, to be fair to Pistone, uh, there is a kernel of, of truth in his analysis. When Sonrethel contemplates what the synthesis centered on labor, that is communism will look like, he sometimes sort of implies that like non-empirical extraction, extra, abstraction could be dispelled in favor of some kind of vaguely defined harmony between man and nature. You know, or just get rid of it, abstraction, done. <laughs> you know, like, um, and uh, I think in those, kind, those moments, he does succumb to the sort of utopis, utopization of labor uh, that Pistone attributes to him. Um, so again, notwithstanding, you know, um, the, the, the importance of the commodity form to history, the importance of the category of labor to history, I do think that, that um, his analysis has a utopian character when he says, well, we're going to have a synthesis based on labor, and that synthesis is going to uh, demarcate the end of abstraction, um, as he implies sometimes, not always. Um, at times, though, Son Rethel kind of goes in the other direction, arguing that the answer is not the abolition of abstraction, uh, but rather its imminent self-development. This is apparent when he states, there are signs that our 20th century science, which has achieved the enormous advance to atomic and nuclear physics, has left bourgeois science behind and has assumed a state where it no longer fits the rationality on which capitalism relies for its continuance. So seen this way, the question I think is one of, not of you know, purifying labor or, or purifying science, right? The question becomes <laughs> one of, I think someone has their mic on, okay. Um, the, the question becomes one of reflexivity, right? Uh, you know, in the same way that labor labors to deplete the labor market, leaving behind it a crisis, crisis of effective demand that can spark revolution, so too is it the case that science, even if it's set on by capital, can outstrip its strictures, right? And this again is the shift with capitalism where um, before there were these forms of knowledge, but science actually becomes industrialized in a capitalist context, right? Because it becomes crucial uh, to the appropriation of use values. And, you know, reading Jason Moore, be very profitable uh, in that respect. Um, we see this in the way that the Newtonian deterministic machine uh, Adam Smith used as his template, uh, you know, because I, and Adam Smith, you know, is very, very influenced um, by Newton. And we see this with inertia as well, right? Because for Smith, um, you know, labor defines value unless another input sort of intervenes, right? Um, and I think that what's really interesting is that if you look at subsequent physical developments, right? Um, it's not that they said like, oh, Newton, everything you said is wrong as such, right? It was contextualized as only functioning within a certain kind of band, right? Um, and I think you can see a similar thing with Marx's relationship to classical political economy, you know, the law of value, um, you know, for example, Marx says, well, look, 
you know, these assumptions may hold under certain contexts, but it's only within a certain kind of band that they hold, right? You can't just, just generalize, right? And say that this applies to all, all of history or, uh, you know, that, that's what Marx at his best would say anyway. Um, we also see it, I think even more obviously, uh, in the way that science says, you know, we could talk about ecology, climate, climate science, uh, you know, branches of natural science and so forth, have come to reject the image of nature as a pacifized externality, uh, a kind of image that's at the root of our climate crisis, right? And this is what Moore sort of gets at in his work, right? The way that, that nature is sort of cultivated as this, this, within this binary, as this kind of pacifized category, um, you know, in order to permit capitalism uh, to uh, appropriate the use values it requires uh, for its reproduction. But I think now there's a lot of pushback from that, even coming from within science, right? Which shows the way that science can, um, you know, have this sort of reflexive rotary process, right? Um, if this is the case, right? If we see this uh, sort of uh, analogy, right? Between the way that um, science can outstrip its context. Um, and I like, I like, I always like, you know, Stalin says this, proletarian science, bourgeois science. I, I, I use a little determinable of Stalin, you know, for me, proletarian science is science that kind of outstrips its context, um, like, you know, Marx in relation to classical political economy, um, you know, whereas, uh, you know, bourgeois science is sort of the, 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 the science which stays within uh, the purview of capitalist categories. Um, but if we accept uh, uh, this sort of, uh, uh, theory that there's this sort of analogy between the reflexive movement of labor, right, which, which you know, uh, labor actually, uh, by, uh, you know, permitting the accumulation of dead capital, creates the, the means through which labor itself can be uh, transformed or perhaps abolished, right, that science actually, in its process, has the potential to outstrip uh, its limited context and outstrip the mode of production, then the question here wouldn't be dispensing with abstraction, um, but the question would be intensifying it to the point where it explodes the fetters our mode of production has imposed. Um, and, you know, I really wanted to end here because I thought it was a dramatic ending, but there's one last thing I have to say. I have to give you a little encore here. Um, I think I just have to say this. One thing, if I have to say about Postone and San Rethel, I think one thing that we have to understand here is that neither of them really evince an understanding of the importance of the proletariat as an agent of its own self-abolition, as a sort of reflexive agent uh, in this way, as an agent of intensification. Um, but for different reasons. Uh, Son Rethel's valorization of sort of generally defined manual labor over intellectual labor. Um, so this idea, you know, in a way, Son Rethel, when he posits this category of manual labor, he doesn't make the distinction specific enough to capitalism. I mean, obviously, he's aware that you have these changes in production. Um, but I think this category is a bit of a, um, you know, not a great one. Um, you know, the problem is that when he uses a category like manual labor and, and compares it to intellectual labor, what's maybe lost there is the specificity of proletarian organization. Of course, as Marx points out, you know, it is true, right? You can, you can juxtapose manual and intellectual labor going back to ancient Egypt uh, and so forth. So because of this, Son Rethel, uh, you know, I think this is part of why he, at the end of um, intellectual and manual labor, and I have to talk about this because I feel like everyone tries to ignore this, so I have to talk about it. But uh, the way he really uh, uh, valorizes uh, the Cultural Revolution, he says, if you look at what they're doing um, in China, um, you know, this is this is a, a really remarkable possibility of eliminating the division between intellectual and manual labor. But I think what what Son Rethel's analysis lacks is a recognition, you know, of why the proletariat would be for Marx sort of the universal class of why there has to be industrial productivity to access uh, the realm of freedom. Right. Um, I think, you know, a lot of remarkable things were obviously accomplished uh, in China in, in the Mao period. Um, but, you know, it doesn't and I would never, you know, I wouldn't want to denigrate it in any way, but I think it's also clear that it doesn't meet the criteria of, 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 of what Marx described as sort of the universal class of the proletariat in his own work as being, right? Um, and of course, you know, if you don't have this sort of industrial productivity, you end up getting what Deng Xiaoping sort of derisively called the socialism of poverty, right? Um, you know, and that's a, whether, whether, you, whether you love Deng or no, I think there is something to that point. Um, by contrast, so that's sort of how, how Son Rethel, I think, uh, uh, loses sight of the importance of the proletariat is with the sort of overgeneral category of manual labor. By contrast, I think Postone, um, the reason why he evaluates, of course, the reification of the social category of labor in the form of communist states or proletarian movements negatively. But to evaluate something negatively isn't, I, I think it's not the most dialectical or subtle tendency. Um, 
you know, uh, one thing I think really about Pistone is that his his critique of, you know, he says, you know, the USSR, that's kind of just like nonsense. They didn't they didn't understand Marx. They didn't read Marx properly. They just they just messed that one up. Um, you know, actual unions, labor struggles, you know, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I think one thing here that's absent um, is actually examining the way that these uh, practical movements um, relate to the global reproduction of capital. And I don't see that uh, in Pistone's work, uh, for example. Um, if we look at, at communist states, uh, you know, sort of traditional communist states, not post Deng China, um, you know, they played a very, very important role uh, in, uh, you know, limiting uh, the exploitation of labor power uh, in the underdeveloped world by Western capitalist firms, which um, you know, we can read Lenin or Amin, right, is, is crucial to the reproduction of capital. Uh, we can also talk about uh, the role that, that labor unions and so on played, um, you know, in affecting the rate of profit and um, not just reforming, but at times even, even destabilizing uh, capitalism, right? It's often remarked, this is often remarked about the UK, right, that prior to the miners' strike, in a way, the logic of capital, its fundamental basis had actually been challenged by the strength of labor in the United Kingdom, right? So I think, you know, in this case, um, you know, even if I'm going to mostly agree, and 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 I think uh, with the 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 analysis of Son Rethel, which I think has been, um, you know, uh, misrepresented and underestimated in a lot of important respects, uh, I think one way in which uh, we should perhaps um, break with both uh, Pustoni and Son Rethel uh, is in pitting ourselves against sort of fashionable claims of a new proletariat you know, the hacker tariot or whatever the hell, uh, or fashionable talk of sort of the death of capitalism uh, in favor of restating of the significance of the proletariat, which is exceptional, even if it's one episode uh, in a larger history of the exploitation uh, of surplus labor. Uh, and I will finally say uh, that I think this restatement uh, of the centrality of the proletariat, because we always like to talk about, you know, how we don't, uh, you know, we don't live, it's, you know, we've surpassed, you know, Marx's capital is, is passe, you know, if we look at on a global scale today, uh, the world is far more industrialized than when Marx wrote Capital. You, know, you don't have to do, do more than to go to Shenzhen or Mumbai and you will see that, right? And even if in the West, there's been crucial changes in the way our mode of production functions, um, you know, when people have these discussions, when they say, oh, we've eclipsed, you know, the proletariat, we've eclipsed Marx's concepts, um, you know, in the West, usually they rarely discuss the fact that, you know, so much of the production in China today is uh, uh, symmetrical in certain respects with what we uh, find in the model of dust capital. So I end with a wonderful picture of Chinese uh, labor union uh, there. Uh, thank you for your time. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Conrad. Uh, it's always difficult at the end of uh, online presentations because you can't clap or heckle but there is a facility if you want to put clap hands on your uh, on your screen. I personally prefer people to send me money via PayPal, but that's, that's just me. Okay, well, we already have some questions. So okay. I'm going to open the floor and I'm going to ask Giovanni uh, to ask the first question. Giovanni Capoioni, if you can pardon my pronunciation. Um. Hello everybody, sorry for my, uh, my, my video that it doesn't work. And do you hear me anyway? Okay, thanks. So Cora, thanks you for this. I, I clap my hand for this uh, great presentation. And uh, okay, I'm a PhD student uh, in London, uh, University of London with a thesis on uh, Althusser, Marx and Rousseau. Uh, but um, I want to ask you a, a very simple question about, I mean, the root of this uh, idea of Son Rettel about uh, put it in simple like you did like the properties of our thought come from a previous logic of commodity exchange i mean isn't it a little bit paradoxical as well each exchange act is not an exchange act between two robots of two uh, automatas but between two people that uh, in a kantian or descartes, descartes way have uh, an intention to exchange different use values i mean social use values um, uh, through a logic i mean the logic is i want your use value commodity a and i can give you back uh, my use value commodity b because they have the same value so i mean it seems a kind of circular reasoning to say that our logic of exchange comes from the logic of exchange uh, while 
this same logic is a, is a historical creation of humans that are in a way agreeing on a common notion of value, even if they don't agree that this notion of value is coming from social labor power, abstract labor, but they agree that there is a kind of common value, they are exchanging it, they are not sleeping when they are doing it, so they are perfectly conscious. So I really don't get this idea that uh, a logical act that already presupposes rationality is caused by the formal rules of the exchange. I, have non, I don't know if I've been clear enough. Uh, thank you. Sure, that's, that's perfectly thank clear. You. That's, can I respond now, yeah? Okay. Yeah, go, are go. You, Okay, that's that's perfectly clear, and I think it's it's uh, a serious problem, which is why when I was presenting, um, and and perhaps I did it sort of too schematically, uh, but I tried to discuss the difference between uh, language and and what I called the language of commodities. Actually, I, I didn't have time to get into this here, though maybe I touched on it a little bit with the the B day. Um, but one thing I attempt to do uh, in my thesis is to uh, relate, um, you know. Uh, various writings, you can say by, by Stiegler, by uh, Darwin, by Leary Gorhan, by Engels, uh, on the way that, um, you know, tool making uh, and tool use, uh, you know, is generative of language. Uh, and you see Oren Kolodny has been talking about this lately, the idea that um, when you make tools that there's, it, it creates the capacity for sequencing that later becomes formative of linguistic patterns, right? Um, and that you have to examine that as well as the sort of partial abstraction of labor, which is characteristic of, of any uh, kind of tool being, you know, bestowed to different members of a group, um, and that you'd have to examine that and try to sort of build up. And I think, you know, Simone Doan can be interesting in other people. But I, I fully agree with you that, you know, something Son Rethel doesn't provide and something that creates a lot of confusion is that he doesn't look to try to identify uh, which elements of, of abstraction, if you will, or, or ra social rationality are already there prior to, uh, you know, the seventh century, well, a little bit prior to the seventh century in BC and ancient Greece, but prior to the beginnings of commodity exchange. Yeah, so, so I mean, the main point is, it's not only a question that these people are exchanging things because they are following a kind of unconscious logic. I mean, they are doing this with intentions, like uh, I give you this, you give me that, they have the same, the same value. And this has nothing to do with labor power spent and so on. But uh, I mean, uh, don't you think there is a kind of paradoxical uh, point of view from Sorrettel saying like this logic was coming from exchange but is needed for exchange that's what, what I want to say right? is, okay is, thanks Giovanni thank you Conrad respond okay um you know I mean I don't I mean how would you how would you talk about the relationship between you know thought and materiality in any convincing way if you were to simply say that it's paradoxical Right. I mean, you know, I think that, um, you know, it, it, it raises important questions of, of philosophical causality and, and really throws us on to, uh, uh, you know, very, very classical questions. But uh, I, I don't know. I don't know further what to say uh, to that short of the fact that I think that, um, you know, science uh, often doesn't conform to, uh, you know, all of the uh, demands of uh, inductive philosophical reasoning. You know, that's all I would say. OK, Richard. On that particular point, the point raised, the question, um, there's a passage in Intellectual and Manual Labour in which uh, Son Rettel discusses what he calls a second abstraction, not real abstraction, but what he calls the abstraction of pure quantity. And he says, well, this arises from what he calls the equality postulate, the postulate that the commodities being exchanged are equal, equal in value. And then he insists that it's the bringing together of the commodities that causes the equality postulate, rather than the equality postulate being a precondition for commodity exchange. Now, that's um, typical Son Rettel, and you don't really know whether he's talking about logic or history. It's very often the case in this book that, that you don't know whether he's talking about logic and history, and he is talking about both, and he never makes it quite clear which he's talking about. Now, the point he's just made, which I've described, as a logical point, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to evaluate. If, on the other hand, you take it as a historical point, and this, I think, um, is a, some kind of response to the, the question, um, then it's extremely likely 
that there is an exchange of commodities broadly defined, which are not based on the, on the equality postulate. People don't, as it were, from the Garden of Eden onwards, exchange things because they're of equal value. I mean, they exchange gifts, which don't have to be of equal value. And the gift can gradually uh, be transformed into commodities, which are then subsequently uh, have to be of equal value for, in order for the exchange to work. So that actually, historically, there's a good case for saying um, that Sir Rittle is right, though he may not have realized it, that the, 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 the exchange of goods uh, in a, in a, first in a in the gift and then in a more somewhat commercial a dimension and then a fully dimensional, fully commercial dimension, that that precedes what he calls the equality postulate and everything that goes with the equality postulate, which is, uh, as he defines it, the, uh, the abstraction of pure quantity. I'm sorry, that wasn't a question. It was just a, <laughs> it wasn't quite a 10 minute contribution, Paul, but, I, but uh, I, I'm afraid it was just a contribution. But, but the, my question is, do you agree? Conrad. Oh, do I agree? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I think uh, that's, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that sounds right. I mean, obviously we know that if we're talking about, um, you know, and there's been a lot of, it's really interesting, right? Like, even if you look at, um, like Umaric, you know, Ionian poems, Umaric poems and things like that, like gift giving, right, becomes uh, a really significant theme. And I think it's interesting in those uh, sort of literary contexts, um, and they would necessarily be literary because we're not talking about, you know, uh, societies in which even a notion of, of proto-science had really been developed. Um, there is a focus on sort of reciprocity of gift giving, um, but the notion of reciprocity is, I would say, extremely uh, approximate. Um, you know, and I think that sort of agrees, if I'm not mistaken about what you're saying, Richard, I think that sort of agrees with, um, you know, your, your point here that, um, you know, starting from these, these very, very loose and approximate conceptions of what uh, reciprocity would entail, um, which, you know, we might not even conceive of reciprocity from the standpoint of the present and how value is actuated, um, that you can approach something, right, that amounts to a more, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, more accurate quantitative equivocation of value. Yeah, the point being is that gift exchange doesn't require or produce abstraction, whereas commodity exchange does because of mm -hmm. the need for equality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Okay, have we other questions? I'm giving people time to formulate theirs. While I'm doing that, I'm going to abuse the chair and ask a question myself, Conrad, which is for you to speak a little bit more about the abstraction of intellectual from manual labor and the dangers that that abstraction, as in your quite entertaining and interesting charts, ma specifying manual as opposed to intellectual labor or intellectual as opposed to manual, does create difficulties when we talk about particular issues of commodity exchange and exchange value. How would you, can you elaborate a bit on that? I'm just, I'm just interested for you to say a little bit more about that abstraction in and of itself, that distinction between intellectual and manual labor. Yeah, okay, so I think, I think it's actually interesting, right? Like, um, I forget the name of the author, but I read through the book, it was like 700 pages a few days ago. Uh, the class struggle in ancient Greece. Uh, Richard Seifert, do you know who who wrote that off the top of your head? Uh, De Saint Croix. Yeah, 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 yeah. I read that one. Yeah, and so he, uh, you know, Marx talks about. You know, Marx is very clear about setting the the origins of intellectual and manual labor. Um, you know, well beyond uh, the 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 context of capitalism. Um, you know, in this text that I was referring to. Um, you know, the author talks about how we could perhaps understand if we're looking at, you know, uh, uh, the Greece of antiquity, uh, we could look at, um, I don't know if, if you agree, Richard, but we could look at, um, you know, the, the distinction as being between uh, those who had property and those who didn't as being the fundamental uh, sort of class divide. So I actually think, you know, I think that on one level, um, you know, if you look at, you know, this, this very long history of surplus labor, uh, exploitation, tributary extraction, and so forth, it is possible to talk about 
intellectual and manual labor um, in this more trans-historical way. But I think that one can't lose sight of the specific, specific importance, right? You know, of the proletariat uh, within a, a capitalist context, right? Um, you know, and obviously there's there's a number. It's a bit irreducible. There's a number of reasons for that, right? Um, you know, the the proletarian, uh, you know, is a mass class, right? Um, you know, it acquires certain forms of uh, certain freedoms that allow for its self-development. Uh, it's able to sort of relatively easily slam the emergency break of production. Um, more uh, uh, poetically, perhaps, uh, I always like, uh, you know, uh, what Lukash says, which is that, um, you know, the uh, proletariat is in a sense the universal class because it's able to perceive itself as an object, right? Which means that, you know, having perceived itself as an object, it's able to connect its own objectification to sort of the automatic subject of capital, right? Um, so I think, you know, there's actually room for both of those distinctions. I just think that what's a little bit risky uh, and, and what um, Son Rethel does um, is I think he moves to, um, you know, he moves too hastily towards uh, the application of this generalized principle of manual labor. Um, uh, towards, um, you know, suggestions for political praxis in the present, you know, and that's where I think you get, uh, you know, this sort of uh, effusive uh, endorsement of, for example, um, the Cultural Revolution, which I don't think um, uh, is adequately considered in terms of how it relates to these categories, right? So, so I said there is a real reality to that, I want to stress, right? But I just think that one has to be very, very uh, careful, um, you know, about, about um, and at times, Son Rethel is very, very diligent in acknowledging that, um, you know, I think at times he, he, he gets the better of himself. Um, I, I think, you know, one has to be very, very careful about uh, uh, demarcating and recognizing uh, the significance uh, of the, you know, pervasive commodification of labor power. Okay, Brent. Brent? He, he asked the question in the chat. Okay, well, if Brent isn't on mic, I will ask the question for him. And that is, Song Rethel postulates a twofold abstraction, mental and real. Have you considered a four dimension version mapped on what's sometimes called a quadrant model? It would go top left to bottom right, mental, physical, social material, giving us four types of abstraction rather than two. This is my model as abstraction is more ubiquitous than we think. And then he also adds, MMTRs seem to critique or reject real abstraction. They opt for more non-zero-sum reformulation, undercutting some of the assumptions of Marxism. Can anyone elucidate this divide and how it might be reconciled? And that's in the chat, Conrad, if you want to refer to the text. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like, I don't, I'm, I'm really not um, an expert in MMT. And I'm sure like a lot of people could, you know, would know more about that um, here than I do. But, um, you know, I'm not sure if I would be mistaken in reading it as being, uh, you know, analogous in certain respects, um, you know, to, to Keynesianism. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it seems to me that one of the claims that's central that's made by MMT, again, I risk vulgarizing, uh, is that, um, you know, we should sort of just take, uh, you know, extensive state loans, right, because, you know, we have access to them at a very low rate of interest uh, and invest them in things. Um, but, you know, um, I'm not sure uh, if this can be really uh, treated as um, zero sum, even with respect to the model that Marx postulates, because I think the issue here is that, um, you know, there has to be, um, you know, in terms of the relationality of value and labor, there has to be some kind of productive investment. Right. You know, in the most obvious sense, if you borrow a bunch of money, you know, and then just set it on fire, that's not really helping. Right. Um, you know, so the question is, what is it doing? Right. Is it, you know, employing labor to generate productive gains for society? Um, so I don't know, maybe maybe that's that's not an adequate answer. But um, uh, as for the, the four quadrant thing, um, you know, I don't um, uh, I, I don't feel like I can really comment based on the, the, the fairly vague details you provided. But uh, I do. You know, I'm a big fan of charts and quadrants and um, you know, I think that there's a lot of room for elaborating on on Son Rethel's work, which I think, you know, we should really take as a, uh, I see a first volley in what I think has to be a larger process of creating, a, a, you know, a science of subjectivation and a science of epistemology, you know, as, as taking that as a real rupture in the history of philosophy in terms of what we're capable of accomplishing. Okay, 
Okay, we still have about 15 minutes left if there are any questions. Remember, no question is too simple or too complicated to ask. No one? Ah, Tor. Tor's just shutting the door and he's coming back to us. Hi. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I was a bit curious about your uh, comments uh, regarding language as a form of abstraction without commensurability. And, uh, and if this is something Son Rittel has written on in himself or if you develop. Um, and one of the reasons I'm arguing, and this is not really a developed line of thought, but it's something I'm quite interested in exploring, is how, for example, Saussure in his structuralist account of language actually develops it through an homology with marginalist economics and its, its account of money, which becomes really bizarre when you read it. But uh, yeah, that's my question. <laughs> that's, 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 that's wonderful. Um, yeah, uh, I actually, uh, I, keep my, I keep my thesis open at all times in case I need to you know, run to it and hit control F uh, really quick. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a full on in the age of control F, you know, knee deep in it. Um, so here we go. I have a couple quotes by uh, San Rethel on the subject, which I do develop. I mean, that's what I was getting at when I was talking about, um, you know, applying uh, some of the ideas of I was talking about people like Larry Gorhan and Stiegler, which you find even in, in Darwin and Engels, right, on tool use uh, and, and tool making um, and language um, and, uh, you know, trying to delineate maybe an, an antecedent state of abstraction, right, based on that. Um, but I have, uh, I have uh, some notes here. So San Rethel says, um, now what two people need or feel or think, but whose need, feeling, or thought will prevail is what shapes the relationship. Thus one can justifiably say that commodity exchange impels solipsism between its participants. Accordingly, commodity exchange does not depend on language, on what we communicate to each other. Nothing regarding the essence of things needs to be communicated. Some semantics for yes and no, for pointing to this or that, and to indicate, indicate quantity is sufficient to the essentials of a transaction of exchange, whether it is carried on between two village gossips or between two strangers who do not speak each other's language. Um, so that's one, one quote there you see, which I think is, is very, very interesting. Uh, and also really gets to the, uh, the idea that, that you know, these sort of formal uh, developments happen, as he says, you know, behind the backs, right, of the, the, the exchangers, right, or, or the producers in the original uh, quote by Marx. Uh, the next quote here is, the introduction and spread of coinage, however, ousted communal production and heralded a form of social synthesis rooted in reification, so-called because the social context of people is transformed into the social context of their products intercommunicating in the monetary terms of their prices, their commodity language, as Marx puts it. Um, and that's actually from the, um, that's actually from the, um, uh, the first section of, of Marx's Capital. I think in the English uh, one, if you want to look it up, it's the language of commodities. Uh, Marx actually, uh, though Marx doesn't historicize the concept in that uh, particular passage. Yeah. Does that help? Okay. Uh, do you mind, Paul, do you mind if I respond to one Richard Seifert asked earlier about, uh, do you mind if I respond to this one? Okay. Uh, Richard, Richard Seifert asked, uh, is it not the case that SR explicitly excludes labor from his investigation of real abstraction because he regards real abstraction as deriving entirely from commodity exchange? I think it would be, I, I don't know, Richard, you might have a different view of this, but I think it would be more uh, safe to say that he excludes an attempt to develop like a systematic analysis um, of uh, the relationship between labor and value, but there's still quite a few comments uh, about uh, labor. Of course, um, you know, in a way, the, the, what Marx sort of refers to as the modern category of labor would have to be excluded, right? Because if we're talking about, um, you know, how surplus product is being generated, you know, then we're talking about slavery, you know, tributary production and so forth. And there are quite a few comments, you know, on slavery, for example, and, and the relationship between these uh, uh, historical stages in, in intellectual and manual labor. So, so I don't think it would be fair to say that he entirely, uh, maybe it's systematically excluded in a way, that relationship, well, but- I, I think actually, there is a certain point in the text where he does explicitly exclude it. I mean, he's very well, it's as if he's aware he's going to be criticized for this, and indeed yeah. he is criticized for it. Mm -hmm. And what, what he says is that, you know, of course, labor is important 
as he puts it, as, as an economic issue, <laughs> mm. he calls it, uh, when you're concerned with the quantity of value. But he says, yeah. I'm not concerned with the quantity of value. I'm just concerned with the form of value. And mm. the form of value derives purely from commodity exchange. It's got nothing to do with labor. Doesn't mean he doesn't realize the importance of labor mm. in the whole social synthesis. Of course he does. But mm. he actually explicitly excluded labor from mm. the analysis of the commodity exchange as producing real abstraction. I mention that simply because it means to some extent the Postoni kind of critique is irrelevant. It sort of misses the point. So mm. isn't, isn't producing a theory of everything. Uh, he's, he's not doing that. He's producing a theory of a particular cognitive turn, a particular intellectual revolution. Mm. And indeed, indeed, of course, there then become questions, other questions of which is much more vulnerable. The question of the extent to which that cognitive turn is still with us, the extent to which there is continuity and discontinuity between ancient Greece and uh, Kant. And of course, at that point, uh, labor must become important. But I mean, he doesn't, so far as I know, go, go into that. So, but the actual, the actual, his actual point, I think, is a perfectly good one and, and renders mm. much, much of Postoni, I haven't read Postoni's book, but mm. I've read some summaries of it and you've talked about it. It seems to me that mm. it renders much of what Postoni is saying, not exactly wrong, but just irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I quoted from that that passage I think you're talking about because he says, oh, this is like a Marxological sort of controversy that I don't want to get into. Yeah, I mean, but I do think that in a way, like even if you're talking about like, yes, in the abstract sense, uh, it's completely correct that, you know, you can have real abstraction without having addressing these things. But I think that if we're looking at um, the way that, um, you know, value becomes more ubiquitous uh, as a social concept, right, um, and grounds and diffuses real abstraction, then I think you have to look at the relationship between that and labor markets. So there are a number of comments in, in intellectual and manual labor, which I think are suggestive uh, in that way, even if he's not seeking to systemically elucidate that. Yeah, but that are you sense. talking about labor markets in antiquity? Or are you talking about labor markets in early and developed capitalism? Oh, I'm talking you... about, I'm, I, I, well, yeah, I mean, maybe like I shouldn't use the word like labor market, right? I'm talking about like the, the, the sources uh, of like surplus product as well, you know, how we talk about that in antiquity, right? So well, when he talks about yeah. slavery and things like this, this is... Yeah, he, of course he talks about slavery. And incidentally, slavery is far more important in metaphysics, platonic metaphysics, than he realizes. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. really important. It's central to it. Um, and he does talk about slavery, but I still insist that he's definitely excluding completely labor uh, from his analysis of real abstraction and that he is justified in doing so. Now, I mean, there are all sorts of other things you, you can say about the relationship mm -hmm. of labor to, uh, to to commodity production and commodity exchange in the ancient world, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but that very specific defined point, I think, stands. Sure, okay. sure. I, I just... I'm going to intervene here sure. just for a moment uh, because we have one hand up from Howard and we have one question from Brent, and we have about seven or eight minutes. Okay. So by all means, make a quick response, Connor, but I suspect what Richard is raising is going to be going throughout the three days. And I do want to give both Howard and Brent's question a quick airing. Sure, I just want to say quickly, um, I think that, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the sort of most abstract and formal sense, I, I completely concur with you. I just think that um, if we're trying to, you know, one way to, there are suggestions in intellectual and manual, manual labor, but one, one way I think to expand upon Son Rethel's project um, is to try to uh, research and develop more tangible links uh, between the organization of labor in various forms, uh, you know, and uh, value and abstraction. That's all I'd say. Okay, Howard, do you want to quickly give your question? Yeah, uh, actually, um, I, I, uh, I, my point was to reinforce the, uh, uh, one of the points I wanted to make was to reinforce the point that Richard made, which I think is completely correct, uh, that you've just been discussing. In other words, that labor is explicitly excluded. And I wanted to connect that, Conrad, with the quote that you raised. Uh, you said it doesn't go to the essence or something like that. If you if you wouldn't mind reading that again, do you remember the quote that uh, you which, had there? Which quote doesn't go to it the It was essence. the first one that you raised. First one, the first quote on the essence. I'm just trying to figure out what it, we're talking about here. Um, yeah. Let me, let me look. I'm going to control F essence. Yeah, it was, you read when you said you were going to read some quotes. It was the first quote you raised. 
Oh, do you mean the one about uh, the, um, uh, yeah, about, is this about language and commodities are you talking about? Yeah, I think so, right. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, let me, let me pull that up. Um, now, what, uh, now what two people need or feel or think, but whose need, feeling, or thought will prevail is what shapes the relationship. Thus, one can justifiably say that commodity exchange impels solipsism between its, part solipsism between its participants. Accordingly, commodity exchange does not depend on language, on what we communicate to each other. Nothing regarding the essence of things need, need, need be communicated. Some semantics for yes and no, for pointing to this or that, and to vindicate quantity, or to indicate quantity, sorry, is sufficient to the essentials of a transaction of exchange, whether it is carried on between two village gossips or between two strangers who do not speak each other's language. Okay, that again reinforces Richard's point because what is excluded, nothing depends on the essence of things, is the idea that value is a property and, and actually goes to the essence of commodities. And so that's a really important point. And I think uh, it, it exactly goes, is, uh, is fundamental to the critique of Sonret Rattel. So I wanted to uh, ask in relation to both of these uh, uh, points, um, you had uh, commented on the thesis of Sun Rattel. And in, mm -hmm. in reading, uh, I, I got the sense that there was a defensiveness about the labor theory of value. And you mentioned that the thesis discussed marginal utility and so forth. And I mm -hmm. wonder if you picked anything like that up. What do you, what, sorry, what, what's that question? Can you restate that for me? I'm sorry? Can you restate the question for me? I'm just trying to. Yeah, in, you said his thesis in 1928 was about marginal utility theory. Mm -hmm. And I wondered whether you picked up at all in the, in the reading a sense of a defensiveness about the labor theory of value in Marx. You mean you mean in the thesis, or what do you mean in his uh, in, it, globally? In other words, oh, uh, it, if it could start with the thesis, if it's an in intellectual and manual labor and so forth. Yeah, well, I mean, the, of course, the passage we were talking about um, that that Richard and I were talking about um, in intellectual and manual labor. Um, is an attempt to basically, uh, you know, insulate, uh, you know, his analysis from, um, you know, critiques with respect to uh, the sort of uh, lack of equivalence, equivalency between labor and value. Um, That's exactly you know, it. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it, 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 it wants to yeah. step aside from mm -hmm. any kind of dispute about the labor theory of value. Yeah, and but I don't think that that can entirely succeed. I mean, I think it suffices to ground um, real abstraction as a sort of formality predicated on exchange. Um, but I think that, you know, and this is what I've said before, I think that what uh, expanding upon Son Rethel's work will really require, uh, you know, is investigating, um, you know, it, it's a very, very complex subject, right, when we get to different social formations, uh, but investigating, you know, the extent to which uh, there was this link between uh, value or labor or, or no, and how that affects uh, real abstraction as a mechanism. Even we, even, even if we accept that at the barest level, you know, I just don't want, I, I, I really, I don't want to, I want to be very careful about making real abstraction into a sort of like formal mechanism that's just there, right? You know, I think it's something that really has to be periodized and treated as metamorphosing throughout history, right? And I think that that sort of analysis will be, will be crucial to that. Okay, I'll, I want to finish with Brent's last question. And that was any thoughts on Sharp's constitutive abstraction from the Arena Journal, building off Saint Raphael for a renewed socialist practice. Uh, Sharp, who are we talking about here? Sharp, let me see. Mm, Sharp, who? who are we talking about? Uh, I've just read the question. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I haven't read the article, unfortunately, but uh, now I'm going to have to read it. So thank you for the recommendation. Okay, well, what I'm going to suggest is if Brent can actually circulate the URL for the article, that might be something to bring in later. Uh, okay. Okay, okay, we're about at the end of the formal session. Now, let me first of all say that uh, thank Conrad for the session. And I think it was a very good start to the conference.